I'm hoping to talk to you about um, some of the more recent work that we're doing at the minute around coping uh, and stuff that hasn't been published yet, so you're getting hot off the press um, results from some of our research. So um, I don't have to talk to you about what food allergy is. We know what it is. Um, there has been a large amount of research now done looking at how food allergy impacts on quality of life um, and to a lesser extent some research done looking at, at how it impacts on things like anxiety and stress and the worry that it causes. And why does it cause so much anxiety and worry? Well, it's very unpredictable. So most of the children with food allergy are well most of the time. They don't exhibit symptoms until they eat something they're not supposed to. Um, and allergens hide. So it's really hard to see them to decide whether something's safe to eat. And we can't avoid eating. So we can avoid a cat or avoid a dog if we're allergic to that, but we can't avoid eating food. So this is the why, why food allergy in particular, out of all of the allergic conditions, seems to cause this worry and this anxiety over and above things like asthma or hay fever. Um, and of course, there's a financial and social cost as well. So eating is a large part of our lives. It's a large part of our social lives. You might not know that um, there is a huge range of work being done by psychologists across the world, not just in the UK, on food allergy. And it's not just looking at quality of life. So I thought I'd just give you a little flavour of what is being done at the moment. So, of, of course, yes, we're still looking at impact on quality of life, and, but more now about how we can actually improve quality of life. We're looking at things like anxiety and depression. There's research coming out showing that people are starting to report symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder after suffering an anaphylactic reaction or after their child has suffered an anaphylactic reaction which is fairly new and something we need to be aware of and think about how we're going to manage that with our families. There's research doing looking at, you know, what actually do people know about food allergy? And not just people with food allergy, but people without food allergy. There's a lot of misconceptions about what food allergy is, what food intolerance is, what the differences are, how you manage it. And so we're looking at people's understanding of that, of the condition, because then that helps us to work out what sorts of education we need to provide to people. Coping is what I'm going to talk to you about today, so um, I'm going to um, tell you a bit more about that later. But we're all also looking at things like illness beliefs, confidence in managing food allergy, um, using models to predict um, people's intentions to carry their auto-injector and then their actual behaviour. And we're also looking at interventions now as well to help people manage their food allergy better. So there's a lot of research that's being conducted with a psychological bent to it at the moment. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing looking at coping and food allergy management. So the research on coping has mostly focused on children and adolescents and to some extent on parents. Um, there's not much research out there on adults. Um, there's little, very little research out there on adults with allergy anyway, but it seems to be something that's becoming um, more of a hot topic at the British Allergy Conference started, people started talking about, oh, actually we need to be interested in, in adults with allergy because about a third of allergies occur when you're an adult. Um, but there's a clear developmental aspect to management of allergy and there are different strategies that are used depending on the age of the allergic patient. So there has been some work done on this already. So Audrey Dungalvin, who's another um, psychologist you might have heard of um, who works over in Ireland, in Southern Ireland, has done some work looking at focus groups <coughs> with children from as young as six upwards to age 15 and asked them about all sorts of things about how they manage their food allergy and part of that was asking about their coping strategies. And what Audrey found was that actually younger children are much more confident in social situations and that's because they rely on their parents. So they don't have to do a lot of their own management. So social situations they feel quite comfortable in, they know what they need to eat because their parents will tell them this is safe for you to eat. But around the age of about eight, Audrey found that actually social occasions are starting to become a bit more of a source of anxiety. So there's a quote here from a girl aged 10, there's always food about, when I take a first bite there's a moment when you think, is this it? So am I going to have a reaction? Is this safe for me to eat? Older children, as they um, become more autonomous in um, learning to look after their own health, 
um, realise actually parents can't always provide that safe environment. And they're starting to go out without their parents. Um, and they need to control their environment themselves. And this can be quite scary. And some of them use avoidance strategies. So they end up not going out to places where there might be food. Um, they don't talk to their friends about their food allergy. Um, and they try and hide it away. There are also lots of minimisation strategies. So um, again, not talking about food allergy. Um, to avoid things like feeling different or to avoid possible um, bullying or teasing. But there are also adaptive strategies, and this is what I want to focus on quite a lot in this talk, because we hear a lot about how teenagers take risks, they don't carry their auto-injectors, they um, try food, they don't read food la labels, uh, and yes, they do do all of that, but there's a lot of good stuff out there that children and teenagers do do. There's a lot of adaptive strategies that they do use. Um, so Audrey found, actually, about a third of the children and teenagers she was talking to um, were quite independent, they had good self-management strategies, and I'll talk a bit more about those in, in a little later when we talk about the interviews we've been doing. Some work in Canada has found very similar things. Um, younger children, again, really relying quite heavily on um, their parents, um, but as they get older, they use different strategies, and again, avoidance um, of risky foods and places is something that that children and teenagers seem to do. Some teenagers describe actually being really very, very vigilant. And so this can spill over into behaviours that aren't very helpful. So never eating outside of the, the home, for example, because they're too scared to um, try and make that decision whether something's safe to eat or not. Um, always being alert, always being... Um, on guard for um, having a reaction. And of course, this then increases anxiety. So the more hypervigilant you are looking for dangers in your environment, the more anxious you become about your environment. So it is a real balancing act that we need to make sure that children feel and teenagers feel anxious enough that they're going to actually read their food labels and take their water injector, but we don't want them that anxious that actually it's affecting their behaviour the other way. Um, and a few adolescents described actually feeling quite helpless um, about how to manage their food allergy. Um, Mackenzie's done quite a lot of work on, uh, on in the uh, Isle of Wight, down south. Uh, again, interviewed teenagers <coughs> aged between 13 and 18. Um, and again, with her research, she was finding that teenagers don't always just take risks blindly. They do actually... Sort of do a bit of calculating about what the risk might be. And we're finding this with a lot of our children and teenagers, that they sort of they calculate the risk. Now, they might not be doing it in, in an optimal way. We might want to try and teach them how to um, manage risk in a different way, but they are at least trying to manage that risk. So coping involved assessing the risk um, and using a bit of willpower to try and avoid the foods that they really, really wanted to eat. Um, so one um, girl here, age 18, saying, it makes me more conscious of trying to be safe and trying to be prepared. It doesn't stop me doing things. Some teenagers were really strict about managing their food allergy, uh, not taking any risks at all, but then said, actually, my allergy is real high level of burden. I think about it all the time because I'm trying to uh, manage this, this risk in a way that means that... Um, I, I think there are dangers everywhere. Some were a bit, little bit more tolerant of risk, so their level of precautions were slightly different. So they still read their own food labels, but they were a little bit more sensible about what risk they thought it was. So um, this uh, female, age 14, I said, we're supposed to carry our water injectors around school, but I don't, there's not much point because I have a pat lunch. So she knows what is safe to eat. She knows that she can eat what's in her pet lunch and she won't have a reaction. So she's trying to, to balance the, the risk here with what she needs to do in terms of coping. And a minority were actually completely tolerant of risk, didn't really see their food allergy as a problem, didn't take many precautions. Um, and quite often they'll do things like, well, I don't need to read the food labels on that because I've eaten it before and it's fine, so I'll eat it again. And this group said that actually their allergy had that it was the lowest level of burden for them. So assessment of risk is really common. Decisions on what to do. Teenagers are talking about, I'm trying to decide what I need to do. And that was quite common in the literature. So... We know there's some literature out there, so we thought, okay, well, let's, let's do a systematic review. One of the first things that we do if we want to embark on any new research, we need to find 
what's out there already and what do we still don't know. So a PhD student of mine, Jenny Hammond, is doing this work looking at um, how children cope and this is part funded by Allergy UK. Um, and so we wanted to look at children at primary and secondary school age. So for our systematic review, we looked at sort of the age ranges of, of studies that have been, been reported. So we looked at between eight and 19 years of age. We wanted to look at coping as an outcome. And we were looking at all sorts of designs, qualitative with interviews, quantitative with, with questionnaires to see what was out there. So this is our, if anybody's done a systematic review, you know you usually start off with finding thousands and thousands and thousands of papers and you whittle it down to very, very few. So we use some search terms around coping and management of food allergy and those search terms showed that we had nearly 5,000 papers to look at. But actually when we started going through them and looking at our criteria, we ended up with 10. So there are 10 studies at the moment looking at coping in children of that age range. And they're all qualitative, so they're all interviews and focus groups. And we then synthesised all of that information to look at what themes we could find out of those 10 papers. And these are our themes. Coping with risk, coping with emotions, using auto-injectors, support of others, and education, knowledge, and understanding. So I thought I'd go through each of those themes and just give you some quotes from each one so you can sort of see what... what um, teenagers and children are talking about in terms of coping. So coping with risk. First of all, not carrying their, um, this was an EpiPen they were talking about, but obviously um, I always say adrenaline auto-injector because there are more available than EpiPen, um, being very BBC there. Um, so Mackenzie here was reporting about assessing risk of being really low uh, and therefore I don't need to carry my auto-injector. So they weren't just forgetting it, they were actually doing something active and cognitive. So we're meant to carry them around school. So this is the same quote as one we've just used and we picked it out in systematic review. But I have a packed lunch, so I don't eat anything that I know might have a nut in it. So they're actually doing something active to think about the risk. Selecting safe foods to eat, just if I like it or not, I just like see what I like and then if it's got nuts in it first, I won't pick it out at all. Um, and then also being prepared. So a lot of the children did talk about how they remember to take their water injector with them. So this girl at 15, I've got a handbag, I take it with me, I just keep them in there. So I, uh, if I need to go out, I know where they are. So you know, the, we do have teenagers out there who do make plans and who do carry their water injectors, which is fantastic. And we, we need to remember that because sometimes I think we get a bit um, despondent that all of our teenagers are all massive risk takers and, and then they're not. Coping with emotions was a, is a big thing across all of the ages. They need to cope with the emotions that come with having a food allergy. Um, some of them used avoidance to manage anxieties. Okay? So I've missed out on parties because I just won't go. Um, and the problem, as we know from sort of a psychological perspective, the more you avoid something because you're anxious about it, the more anxious you're going to get about it. So the only way to overcome anxieties, it's the same with phobias. Um, you have to expose yourself and you have to and put yourself in a position that's going to make you anxious in order to reduce your anxieties. So these, these children and teenagers aren't doing that. They're using avoidance strategies, which will actually compound their anxieties. They also use avoidance in terms of discussing things with their friends. Um, and as they get older, they feel less likely and less wanting to actually talk to their friends about their food allergy. They want to appear more normal. They want to be like their friends. They don't want to be labelled as that child with the food allergy. So um, some of the, the children were talking about, um, I'd only mention it if something came up. I wouldn't actually talk to my friends about it to start off with. If I had to say why I couldn't have something, I'd say, well, I'm not hungry. So, of course, then this means that if they did ever have a reaction, their friends wouldn't know what was happening to them. They wouldn't know that they'd got an allergy. They wouldn't know how to, how to help their friend. But some did use things like positive reinterpretation, and we, we see this quite a lot in our even young children. They compare themselves to others, and they say, well, actually, I'm not that bad, because some, of them, some people are much worse than me. So there's some people who have to be really aware because if they just smell it, they have a reaction. So I'm okay. I'm not as bad as them. And they use that as a way of coping with their emotions. 
Not surprisingly, using auto injectors is a, is a big one. So um, there's a lot of uncertainty around using them because teenagers and children talk about when they're not sure how to um, identify if they're having a reaction or not. And if they are having a reaction, they're not sure if it's an anaphylactic reaction or not. And quite often, they won't take their own to eject to when they should have taken it because they don't think it's serious enough. Um, or it's not like it happened before, or this has never happened before that I can remember, and I really don't know what I'm, what I'm doing here. And then there's also the avoidance because of fear. So fear of needles, is it going to hurt? Um, I'd rather get my mum to do it. Okay. Support of others, we found, that, again, there's real clear developmental change. So relying on parents to assess risk and manage food allergy, particularly for the younger children, um, and relying on parents to manage practicalities of things as well. So there's a big emphasis on support of parents. Um, and then the final one we found in our systematic review was education, knowledge and understanding. And it's really important that people um, have a good understanding of their, of their allergy or any condition in order to be able to manage it and cope with it well. So the impact of education and knowledge is really key. So Sophie here was talking about, I thought I was having an asthma attack, which is really scary. It's like, I thought if I had an anaphylactic shock, I'd be throwing up because that's what it was like when I was little. That's why I didn't use the EpiPen. I didn't know I, it was what I was having. So this lack of understanding and lack of knowledge means that her coping strategies are different to if she, if she realised she was having an anaphylactic reaction, then she might have then have used her pen. Um, and some adolescents talked about how they thought that actually education would be um, really useful and useful for them, but also useful for their friends. Um, so this um, boy here is talking about those Annie dolls, maybe the ones you learn CPR on. Well, if we can get those and maybe do it on that and actually have a real injector um, so you know what it feels like to do it. Um, and so a lot of teenagers are saying, well, if I could use, use the injector on myself, I'd know what it was like. Um, and then I'd be less scared about using it again. And again, it's this being anxious about the unknown. So that was our systematic review. And we felt that although there was a lot of research out there which we could pull out some of the coping strategies, a lot of the studies hadn't set out to actually measure coping or talk about coping. It was all around, well, how does this allergy have an impact on your life? And we were having to try and sift through the data to, to work out what the coping strategies might be. So we've decided to actually do some interviews with um, children from 8 up to 16 to specifically ask them about how they cope. And what's really interesting is that um, some of the themes that have come out are similar, some are quite different, but between the young um, children and the older children, the themes are quite similar, but how they, how they cope within those themes is, is subtly different. So 8 to 11 year olds, know there's the risk out there, but they don't really do much thinking about that risk because they rely on their parents much more. They know that knowledge is really important and managing emotions is very important and managing that identity of being a child with food allergy. Whereas the teenagers are actually doing a bit more calculating around risk. They know what the risk is and they're trying to work their way through that. So they're not relying on others as much. They're still needing to deal with their emotions that are related to food allergy, and they're now dealing with actually growing up um, even more as an adolescent. So what I've done, again, just a few quotes for you, because I think this brings it to life more, more than anything else. So, um, and I've sort of showed you where the, the, the commonalities are between the systematic review, which is the SR, and our 8 to 11-year-olds, and then our 12 to 16-year-olds, and how we've got differences across. Um, we've... All the quotes are coming from the 8 to 11-year-olds because we're still looking at the 12 to 16-year-old data at the minute. But with our 8 to 11-year-olds, they're thinking about, well, what's the perception of risk? So I, I have to just watch where I am and where I'm sat and things like that. Do, don't touch somebody else's food so that I don't have a reaction. Nine-year-olds are thinking about this and working out what they need to do. Francis, age 10, if I'm going to my friend's house, he only lives down the road from me, and I re won't really bother to carry my EpiPen because it's normally fine. Again, relying on past experience there might not be the most adaptive thing to do. We might want to advise, well, you never know, and you don't know when accidents happen. You might always want to take your pen with you. Um, but that person is still uh, gauging the risk, thinking about it. And Millie's saying, 
at 10, I check the food labels around the supermarket if I want to try something new. So these um, young people, these 8 to 11-year-olds, are thinking about the risk and what they need to do. The role of others really does map onto what we found in the systematic review. Younger children are much more reliant on parents and teenagers are having to negotiate life away from parents. So um, here Francis talks about, well, my mum normally carries my Echo 10 for me because she has a bag, so I don't need to do anything. Um, um, but Christopher's saying, well, I normally check with mum first to see if it's okay. Even if I think it's okay, I just want to make sure. So they're there as almost as a reassuring for them. I'll do it first and I'll check the food labels, but then I'll get my mum to check. Have I made the right decision? Um, and Jacob talking about feeling worried. Oh, I speak to my mum. I say to her things like, I'm quite worried about my food allergy and she always makes me feel better. So that's really nice. <laughs> so that emotional experience of food allergy, I think, is one of the real, um, really important ones that we're pulling out from the data. Um, our 8 to 11 year olds are having to manage their emotions and our 12 to 16 year olds are also having to manage their emotions. Um, so there are, but there are some things that the children are doing where they're talking about feeling angry, but there are other things they're doing which are talking about what makes them feel happy. And again, um, <coughs> it's nice to hear teenagers and children talking about the things that they can do to make them feel better. So um, the first couple of quotes are around being angry. So sometimes I'm angry that it happened to me because my older brother doesn't have food allergy. My mum and dad don't have food allergy. So why have I got food allergy? So we've been feeling really angry there. And Mike saying, well, I get really angry because I eat certain things and I've gone to my room and I've thrown my things on the floor, which is really silly. So he's doing things to try and manage his emotions and then reflecting back on that, going, mm, that was probably a bit silly of me, wasn't it? Um, but there are other things that perhaps are a little bit more adaptive that children do to manage their emotions. So Jacob saying, well, I, I have a few moments to myself, so I just go and get away from everything and I just take a few moments. Or they try and distract themselves with other things. So I try and ignore it and I do something that makes me happy, like drawing. Or I distract myself and not really think about it and think about something else instead. Moving on from that, um, children, as I said, also talk about what makes them feel better. So Sarah here is talking about, well, I eat the foods I know I can have because that makes me feel happy. That I can actually eat some foods that I want. So sometimes it's not that bad when I can eat some of my favourite foods. So again, they're talking about trying to minimise how serious their allergy is and talking about the things they do which makes them feel better. It's not really that bad, says Francis. I think if maybe I was allergic to more stuff, I'd get really annoyed about it. And Hannah's saying, I feel really get grateful what I can have because there are others out there who have worse allergies or no food. So they do think about comparing themselves to others. And children as young as eight years old are making these social comparisons to other people and saying, actually, I'm not that bad. I can manage. I'm fine. So the translating it into practice bit. <laughs> um, what are we trying to do then? So we were doing all of this research, but, uh, which is great, and it, and it gives us a big insight into what's happening in these children and teenagers' lives. But we need to help them to manage better. Some of them are managed well, and some of them are managing not so well. So interventions are being developed now. There's some educational ones. There's some online and face-to-face -face support groups um, that are being run as, as interventions. And there's now a lot of... Um, Work being done looking at cognitive behavioural therapy and how that might help. Um, unfortunately, the funding for CBT is virtually non-existent. So um, you could get primary care um, referrals. So you, you know, your parents, your families could go to their GP and say, I'm really anxious and my child's really anxious, could you refer me? Uh, and you might um, get, um, be able to get that way. Sometimes you can do secondary care referrals, but the only... Hospitals that I know of in the UK that have funding specifically for psychological support for food allergy are Southampton and Guy's and St Thomas. So that's just two. And they're down south. <coughs> and then there's a private route as well. So you could pay, you know, your parents could pay for this privately. But of course, that can be very expensive. But these sorts of interventions are, are showing to actually improve quality of life, reduce stress, reduce worry, improve these adaptive coping strategies, um, improve the um, knowledge about food allergy and, and, and reduce these rates of allergic reactions. So there are, there are things that you might spot in clinic if you're seeing um, patients and families who might need psychological support. If you've got parents and children exhibiting really high levels of stress and anxiety, 
if they're showing, talking about behaviours that seem to be extremely sort of hypervigilant um, behaviours like not eating outside at all outside the family home. Um, or parents and children that don't seem to know very much about um, food allergy or got some misperceptions about food allergy or even negative attitudes towards it. Sometimes parents don't want to accept the fact that their child has a food allergy and feel very disempowered because they can't fix it. They can't cure their child. Um, and as I said before, having a, a severe anaphylactic reaction seems to be in some children and, and families causing symptoms of, uh, that are similar to post-traumatic stress disorder. So having a severe anaphylactic reaction might trigger anxieties that weren't there before. So that's something to look out for. And I see um, treating allergy as very much a balancing act and treating the psychological impact as very much a balancing act. Um, and I've got a little sort of um, traffic light system here. So the people in the green um, have good self-efficacy, good, good confidence in managing their allergy. They take their auto-injectors with them. They know, they know what, they, what to do. They understand the risk and they have a good quality of life. And they go out and they do the things that, you know, normal, sort of normal people, um, as they would call it, do. So they'll go out and go on holiday and they'll go out and eat, etc. So that's great. We don't need to worry about those people. But um, down one end, we have people, um, patients and families, with really high stress and anxiety. Maybe a lot of hypervigilance, some lack of understanding, maybe, and poor quality of life. And they're, they're the people, really, with, that we need to intervene with and try and help them manage their coping strategies. But down the other end, we've got the ones who don't worry at all, don't do any risk assessments, don't carry their auto-injector, don't have much understanding and are also at risk of accidental reactions. And they're the people we're trying to get at as well. <coughs> so how can we help them in clinic? Well, there are a number of things that, are, that I think are, uh, you, you don't need a psychologist for. Um, and there are some things that you might need a psychologist for. I mean, the first thing, obviously, is to try and make sure that all of our parents and patients have accurate information about food allergy and about the risk of serious reactions that they can really easily understand um, and what reliable web resources are out there because there's so much out there you could read about about food allergy that and a lot of our parents and patients will go straight to the web um, and look for stuff so can we signpost them to something that we know is reliable that they'll be able to understand um, having a trainer pen um, and regularly retraining because we know that as soon as they get home with it, they'll put it in a box and they'll forget about it and they won't use it and then they'll forget how to use it. So showing um, people how to use it and then telling them to regularly retrain. Um, but getting their, you know, the kids to practice with it and getting the kids to show their friends how to practice with it, um, which is easier with the younger kids and not so easy with the teenagers. Um, but encourage them to talk as openly and as often as possible because avoidance increases that anxiety. So being very open about it and talking about it and managing these things from as early age as you can. I mean, our eight-year-olds are talking about creating their own recipes of things that they can eat, you know? So eight is not too young to, for children to be managing their own allergies with, with good supervision. Um, we should be helping them to feel normal because being anxious and worried and stressed is normal. And if they need help, they should feel as if they can ask for it. Um, and a psychologist can be there to listen to their worries, to help them find better ways to cope and manage their allergy. They're not there to, to say, well, you're a little bit crazy, aren't you? Um, and that's what some people think. I've not seen a psychologist. I'm not mad. Um, but actually, if you say to them, they'll give you an hour of your time and you can moan at them for a whole hour, they'll go, oh, yeah, actually, that might be a good idea. And particularly mums who who I work with a lot, who come to see me and say, nobody's asked me how I'm feeling at all. It's all focused on the child with the food allergy, you know, but I'm really struggling managing this. Um, and I would encourage signposting to the anaphylaxis campaign, um, particularly for serious um, allergies, people who are at risk of anaphylaxis. Um, also, there is Allergy UK as well. They have excellent websites and they have information on there which we know is trustworthy it has the information standard on um, and you can signpost your families there and a lot of families have never heard of the charities they've never heard of the anaphylaxis campaign um, it's not something that you put into google when you're looking for allergy is anaphylaxis so sometimes it doesn't come up when people search for it 
So signposting them to the excellent information that the campaign has, I think, is really helpful. OK, and that's it. Thank you very much. I think we've got time for one question. There we go. Um, I will be around the rest of the day if people want to catch up with me as well. So. Just to say thank you very much for a really interesting talk. I'm sitting here as a school nurse um, and having worked for the last 11 years in quite a privileged position in an independent school, which I was given the blank canvas to start because it was a new school, all the policies from scratch. And I can't, I've just recently left to, to, to set up my own kind of training business. And looking around locally, the school nursing is being cut and cut and cut. And I just cannot get my head around that we have a captive audience of children. That's where they spend a high proportion of their time in their yeah. teenage year, uh, in, you know, yeah. their children, childhood, of why we cannot, you know, the school nurses be in and educating these children. Yeah. Because I'm not patting myself on the back, but I know the children now who are in my school, the parents were educated. They had a PowerPoint little kind of card system that yeah. if they went to parties, they could hand it out to the parent. It was all done visually. Yeah. And, it, you know, a, a really clear program. But it's just ironic that we just can't get the school nursing services. Yeah, and, and I think um, putting in education into schools is key. Um, they have their PHSE lessons. We've been talking to children saying... Why don't we have allergy education? We have sex education, but we don't have allergy education. They could easily come and do a couple of hours within a PHSE class and tell us about it. And the kids are asking for this, which is encouraging. And it's the kids without food allergy are also asking for this. So it's one of the things that we're thinking about, thinking about how we can develop um, some uh, materials that could be used in school um, to try and improve attitudes, understanding, knowledge for the children with and without food allergy because because you know it's having your peer yeah. support around you is really important. Well I, I developed what I did is I used the PowerPoint program that I would teach the staff and put that down into a PowerPoint program and then the, the yeah I had a lovely child who was in year four and she was really keen for her peers to know so we did a joint yeah. kind of power uh, you know, PowerPoint presentation yeah. and then she's now in lower sixth and you know, she carries that pen around because yeah. she remembers the day that yeah. she had the anaphylaxis shock. So, if anybody's working, I don't know if people are working in pro with primary school kids. Yep, look for allergy adventures online. Haley Phillips has done a lot of work with primary school children, developing um, workshop activities that are all free to use that you can use with your primary school children in the classroom. Classroom-based activities with different modules for learning about food allergy, learning about cross-contamination, learning about auto-injectors. Um, it's called Allergy Adventures and Hayley Phillips. Um, it's being, some of her stuff is being used in the clinics, particularly here in London in Southampton, um, for that age of children when they come into clinic to help them with their journey through Allergy Clinic as well. So they're really good resources. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>